Hey everybody, this is John for MTG Nexus doing a donation project for Foz. A friend of his is interested in joining the modern format and wanted to buy a deck for $150 or less. So we're working on some budget versions of some decks that he might be interested in to get some idea of what kind of deck that they that player might be interested in purchasing, whether they're interested in aggressive decks, mid-range decks, control decks, combo decks. So for simple purposes, we're starting out with an aggressive deck. An aggressive deck is a deck that tries to reduce its opponent's life total from 20, starting point, to zero as quickly as possible. And for that purpose, we are going to be showing them Burn. Now, Burn is a archetype that is known for creatures. Uh, Things like Soulscar Mage, Monastery Swift Spear, Eidolon the Great Rebel, and also for what they call direct damage spells. So this is highlighted in the card Lightning Bolt, but basically every other spell in the deck does something very similar. Uh, damage can generally go to the face, and can also target your opponent's opposing creatures to get them out of the way for your own creatures. So what makes Burn unique in over other aggressive decks is the fact that it has this twofold attack process of both creatures and spells to get your opponent dead. Toward that end, you ideally want to play a one-drop creature, either like something like Monastery Swift Spear or Soulscar Mage on one, and then follow it up with either Eidolon of the Great Rebel or a flurry of spells to just get your opponent dead. So the unique factors of this deck is Monastery Swift Spear is one two has a mechanic called Prowess, which means every time you cast a spell, uh, gets plus one plus one until end of turn, which increases its power. Soul Scar Mage has something similar, except that it does not have haste, so it cannot attack the turn it comes down. But it does have a unique ability which causes your spells, which would normally the damage is dealt to the creature, and then if the creature doesn't die, the damage falls off at the end of turn. Well, this instead turns your spells into neg negative one, negative one counters. So for each damage one of your spells does to an opponent's creature, it will get depowered by that much. The final creature in this deck is Lailon the Great Rebel, which is a 2-2 creature. Basically, whenever any player, both you and your opponent, cast a spell um, of 3 mana, which mana costs are these little pips up here. So anything that has a combined total of 3 or less deals you or your opponent damage, depending on who casts the spell. Uh, so obviously you have a bunch of spells that are 3 mana or less. Why would you Play something like that in your deck. So you play something like that because your objective is to get ahead of your opponent and then as they're reacting to your stuff they're taking damage as well. Uh, beyond that you have your spells which are Lightning Bolt which is an instant which means you can play it at any time um, pretty much throughout the game as you learn the game it becomes a little more apparent when you can play instants but as opposed to something like a sorcery. A sorcery can generally only be cast during your turn and when there is no other effects uh, going on. So you can only do this on what they call your main phases of magic, which I will leave to Foz to explain to you kind of the phases of magic, or we'll explain them as we're playing games. Uh, so Lava Spike can deal three damage to a player, or what they call a Planeswalker, which is something sometimes opponents control, which are kind of like little brothers to you on the battlefield. Uh, Searing Blaze is what they call a conditional burn spell. It requires both a creature on the battlefield on your opponent's side of the battlefield and a player. So you have to be able to target your opponent and a creature on their side of the battlefield. Or in some cases you might target yourself and one of your creatures, but that's kind of generally not what they do. Uh, normally it does one damage to a creature, one damage to a player, but if you've played a land on that turn, then it does three damage to a player, three damage to a creature. Boros Charm is a mo what they call a moated card. Um, it has three different modes. The one you would normally use is Boros Charm deals 4 damage to target player or creature, or target player or planeswalker. Another thing is it can give all of your permanents, which are things like creatures and lands, things that stay on the battlefield, indestructibility. Or it can give your creatures double strike, which in some cases, like when maybe where you trigger your prowess creatures 2 or 3 or 4 times, would actually deal more damage than the 4 damage mode. Lightning Helix is basically a lightning bolt with uh, three life gain tacked on. So in situations where your opponent like also is trying to kill you, this gives you a little bit of buffer to uh, be able to 
continue casting spells and hopefully get them dead. Rift Bolt is a sorcery, but has a unique ability called Suspend. Now what Suspend is, is you pay this alternative cost, which in this case is one red, and uh, you, what they call Suspend it. During what you call your upkeep phase, which is your basically your second phase of your turn, uh, you remove a time counter from it, which is the Suspend 1, which means that it has a time counter of 1. And then once you remove that counter, the spell then is able to be cast. Even though it's a sorcery, during this unique ability, you can cast it during your upkeep. And then it functions much the same way as Lightning Bolt. You can target a creature, a player, or a Planeswalker. Skewer the Critics is a 3 damage, 3 cost sorcery. However, it has this unique ability called Spectacle, which Spectacle basically says, if your opponent's taken damage this turn in any way, shape, or form, whether they cracked a fetch land, whether they one of your creatures hit them, whether another one of your spells hit them, you can then pay for its Spectacle cost, which is one red. So it's an alternative casting cost to what's going on. So you can either cast this for three mana if you've done no other damage, or you can cast this for one mana if you happen to have damaged your opponent in some other way. In the sideboard of this deck, uh, sideboards are cards you can bring in um, in games two and game three of a set of magic. Um, as long as your starting deck remains the same size, you can switch cards in and out. So theoretically, if you want to bring all 15 cards in, as long as you're taking 15 cards out, you can do that. Uh, for this sideboard purposes, you have a card called Path to Exile, which while this doesn't deal damage to your opponent um, or their creatures, does remove a creature on ideally on your opponent's side of the battlefield at the cost of giving this them a land. Um, so this is a downside, but you know sometimes when you're trying to get your opponent dead as quickly as possible, they may not be have time to leverage that extra card. Then there are four copies of a creature called Core Firewalker. Now Core Firewalker is a white, white card in a primarily red deck. So why would you play this card? This card is primarily for similar minded mages who are trying to get you dead with red spell. This is a 2-2 that whenever any player, whether you or your opponent casts a red spell, you gain a life. So it's ideal in situations where your opponent's also trying to get you dead from 20 to 0 using red cards. So that is the primary purpose of this card in most sideboards. Then you have four copies of Skullcrack. Skullcrack is an instant, so once again can be basically played at any time. Uh, has a couple of things here. So first off it says no players can gain life after this spell is resolved. And then it says damage can't be prevented, which means your opponent can't find ways to stop your damage from happening outside of stopping the spell itself. Then finally it says skull crack deals three damage to target player or planeswalker. Once again, target your opponent's face or their little brother planeswalker. Smash to Smithereens. This is a unique card that has the ability to target uh, card types called artifacts which are typically colorless uh, spells that are permanents on the battlefield that have some type of effect. Uh, you'll run into these sometimes. And then Smash to Smithereens also has the tack on effect of in addition to destroying that, also deals three damage type, Sources Controller. Deflecting Palm is a weird card, especially to explain for a new player. Basically what happens is, is when you cast this card, once again it's an instant, so you can cast it basically at any time, um, so once the spell resolves, you choose something on the battlefield or something on what they refer to as the stack. The stack is the series of spells or abilities that are mythically in the air, but on Magic Online they happen to display them. Um, so you can choose something that's on the stack, or the spells and abilities they're waiting to resolve, or a permanent on the battlefield. And then anytime that permanent would deal damage, that permanent or that source would deal damage to you this turn, it's prevented. And instead it's dealt to your opponent. Or the source the source controller. And then there's two copies of a card called Wear Tear. Now Wear Tear in some ways functions a lot like Smash to Smithereens, and then it can destroy artifacts. I moved over here, so I'm not blocking with the cam. So you can destroy artifacts for one in a red. It also has, there's two sides to this card. There's the wear part, which is one in a red, destroy target artifact. And then there's the tear part, which is for one white, can destroy target enchantment. Enchantment is another type of permanent that will be on the battlefield. It's usually bringing some effect to the battlefield. Or sometimes it's enchanting a, a permanent of your opponent's. 
Alternatively, you can cast the spell for one, a red, and a white, and get both sides and destroy an artifact and an enchantment. So for instance, an enchantment, um, Eidolon and the Great Revel, is in addition to being a creature, also has the enchantment card subtype, which means theoretically you could tear your own Eidolon in some spots if you get into that. So that is burn in a nutshell, other than talking about the mana base. So in the non-budget version of burn, uh, oftentimes you'll see different lands than what's in this deck. So this deck is prioritizing trying to cast rat spells. So the, ba the card Mountain uh, taps for one red mana, hence the red mana symbol here. It's kind of nice with these particular lands, it actually shows the red mana symbol, which is the same as the spells you'll be trying to cast. And then beyond that, you have these, what they refer to as dual lands, Inspiring Vantage, Clifftop Retreat, and Battlefield Forge. So Inspiring Vantage, they each have their own little conditions to, under which they're, they're useful. Inspiring Vantage basically says, Effectively, if, if this is your third land or less, this comes into play untapped. No drawbacks. Can tap for red or white mana. Clifftop Retreat checks to see if you have a mountain or a plains card in play. And if you have one of those in play, then that comes into play untapped. Otherwise, it comes into play tapped. And finally, Battlefield Forge is also, it's kind of a dual land, tri land, depends on. So there are some things in Magic that need colorless mana to be cast, but those, those spells are few and far between, generally. What's notable is you can tap it for colorless mana, not take any damage, or you can tap it for a, a white or a red, but Battlefield Forge will deal you one damage. So this land doesn't typically see play in uh, a fully powered version of Burn, but this is a nice budget land that allows you to be able to cast your Boros Charms, your Lightning Helixes, and the cards out of your sideboard in the postboard games. So, that is pretty much uh, budget Boros Burn. I'm going to go over the uh, fully powered version um, and maybe some differences at the end of this video once we've played a couple of matches and kind of explained what the deck is trying to do. So that said, let's hop into a match or two and help out uh, Foz's friend decide if he wants to play Burn as the deck he wants to pick up. Hey, we're back for our first match with Budget Boros Burn. We are on the play. On the play means basically we have the choice to go first, which as an aggressive deck you always want to do. When you're taking a look at an opening hand for an aggressive deck, you want to see lands and creatures usually. So we have two lands, which is almost ideal. We have one drop creatures, which is great. And then we have follow-up spells. So this hand is a keep. So you want to lead on, at least this build of burn, you want to lead on your creature that doesn't have haste. So we're going to lead on Soul Scrimmage first. So phases of the game, you have your untap step, which you untap your lands. You have your upkeep, which you pay for costs. Um, you have your draw step, which is where you draw a card each turn. And our opponent is on a deck called Humans, which is in another aggressive deck. So what we're going to want to do is, so Eidolon and the Great Rebel normally is a great card, but against this this thing called Ether Vial, which is an artifact that allows you to, your opponent to put cards into play, you don't want to be playing this because it generally inhibits deals you more damage. So instead, we're going to play our other one drop creature which has haste, which means it can attack a turn it comes down. And then we're going to cast our one drop spell called Lava Spike, dealing our opponent damage. And then there's these things that go on this, what they call the stack, called Prowess Triggers, which pump up our creatures, their abilities on our creatures. So we get to deal our opponent three damage, and then we move to the combat step, and then the attack step, which will declare which one of our creatures want to attack. We're going to attack with these ones. Deal our opponent four damage. And then there's a second main phase, which you could cast more spells afterwards, and then pass turn. Generally, each turn you want to uh, play your land drop and cast your spells, move to combat. A lot of it depends on the type of deck you're playing. In aggressive decks, you tend to play, especially burn, you're tending to play uh, things early on anyway. So, opponent is activating their ether vial which means they, they tap it, put the ability on the stack, and then they can have a one-drop creature here. And 
looks like they're going to have a card they call Kite Sail Freebooter. This is a creature that has an enters the battlefield trigger. So champion the parish. Uh, your opponent's creature grows bigger every time they play a human. And Kite Sail Freebooter, they get to look at our hand, take a non-creature, non-land. So basically these two things right here. They're probably going to take Lightning Helix. Because this, this can target their creatures. Boros Charm cannot. So we have the option to play another Soul Skarmage here, but I think what we want to do, since Soul Skarmage doesn't have haste and it's not getting through this turn anyway, and we really don't want to play Eidolon because of, once again, this Aether Vial, what we're going to do is we're going to attack with both of our creatures. Now our opponent knows about the Boros Charm, so they're unlikely to block here anyway, but this gets us in another 6 damage, which is, or actually 8 damage, which is nice. Puts our opponent to five. So now, from now on, our creatures are probably going to get more, less and less effective. And that's one of the things with burn, as the later you go into a game, the less effective your creatures generally are. So you want to get your damage in with your creatures as early as possible. And then generally you want to try to finish off the game with uh, spells from there. I'm surprised they're not attacking with Kite Cell Freebooter. That seems a little... A little goofy. Now playing this land does give away information to our opponent, but uh, I think I'm fine with that. I'm gonna play Soul Scar Mage first, and then even though I'm not a huge fan of Eidolon here, um, I'm gonna play it out because we don't have any spells in our hand right now, and if our opponent wants to deploy anything beyond what they have with their uh, artifact Ether Vial here, they're gonna have to. Uh, cast it and take damage, which they really can't afford to do at this point. Interesting. So they left their Aether Vial on two, but then didn't play anything off of it. Hmm. Or no, that came into three. Alright, so if our opponent has a Reflector Mage, they'll probably just bounce Eidolon and then cast something else. So at this point we're going to hold on to this land because um, we have a card called Searing Blaze in our deck that wants landfall triggers to be more effective. So, go attacks. Yep, Reflector Mage is probably going to target Eidolon. Which is ironic because Eidolon is like a terrible card right now in this situation anyway. but it does enable them to free, be free to cast cards from their hand. Attack with Manus Rider. The blocks take three. It's, has an uh, evasion ability called Flying, which means unless one of your creatures have Flying, you can't block it. It's again, going to replay Idle on here. This is one of the downsides of aggressive decks sometimes, is sometimes you do something called flooding out, which means you're, you're drawing more lands than you want to see. Um, so, so far we have drawn five lands 
out of 20. So 25% of our lands in the top 20% um, of our deck. So we're a little bit ahead of curve of drawing lands. So opponent gets to play another Reflector Mage. Presumably Bounce Eidolon again. Okay. Our opponent is likewise an aggressive deck, but they are a, a more creature-based rather than what they call spell-based deck, which spells are like these burn, uh, these direct damage spells. So, it looks like our opponent's turning the corner rather quickly. So we might have another turn, and have another two turns to draw spells. So I'm going to do what they call chump block, which is basically I'm putting another creature in front of this dam this to just prevent damage. To try to draw us as many draw steps as possible. So I don't want to replay Eidolon at this point because so we're at 11. If our opponent has what they call Thalia's Lieutenant, we're probably dead. So I'm going to pass the turn. Thalia's Lieutenant is what they call a Lord, and then it pumps the team, but it's unique in how it does it. Okay, opponent's got something else to put in the battlefield here. Sure. So are we just dead at the moment if I don't kill that guy? Change the math here. Okay. The reflector mage is very unfortunate. The only question is, is whether we are dead or not. Block here four, eight, ten. So four, eight, ten, thirteen. Block here four, eight, ten, thirteen, sixteen damage. So we have to kill a creature. If I do there, kill a creature, we still take three, six, nine, thirteen, seventeen. 
So if I kill here, we take one, 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 one less. So we take five less, which keeps us alive, but I don't know if we have enough at that point. So I guess as we block here, kill here, hope to rip a searing blaze, pretty much. Okay, do that. And then basically running through what they called combat math to see if there's a way to stay alive. And killing the general takes the most damage off the table. And I think allows us just barely to stay alive here. Yep. Now we need to rip exactly Searing Blaze here. Because Searing Blaze would allow us to kill this and then use Lightning Helix to kill them. And we draw land. Alright, that's unfortunate. So the matchup like this, we want Path Exile because it deals with creatures. And it's not really intuitive, but we want this card, in, at least in some numbers, called Skullcrack. Because our opponent brings in a card called Oriok Champion, which has protection from red and gains our opponent life every time a creature enters the battlefield. A card that we will board out in this matchup is Boros Charm. Because Boros Charm specifically does not interact with creatures and is the least mana efficient of our spells in that regard. Or we could board out Eidolon of the Great Rebel. Um, Eidolon of the Great Rebel, as we saw, was kind of terrible because they have that card called Aether Vial, which allows them to play spells without casting them, so they're, therefore they're not taking the damage. So we're actually going to board out these and a couple copies of Boros Charm to bring in the other copies of Skullcrack. So once again, Skullcrack doesn't interact with our creatures either, but it does give us the ability to potentially uh, trick them into blocking with Oriok Champion in order to kill their creature. Because that um, it has that ability that says no dam damage cannot be prevented. Uh, this one's good. Um, we have three one-drop creatures and a spell. So we want to go lead on Soul Scar Mage again first, and then play the Swiss Spears the following turn. So this hand is a keep. So, this Soul Scar Mage has to the turn. Once again, opponent goes their main phase, plays a land. Let's see what they cast. Their deck has a quite a few one drops. They have that Aether Vial that we saw. They have a card called Champion the Parish, which we also saw. And then they have this card, Noble Hierarch, which allows them to get ahead on mana. So, Noble Hierarch does allow them to play uh, spells ahead of Curve a little bit. But I think we want to get our creatures on the battlefield first, and then try to start leveraging some spells. <laughs> Once again, our creatures are less effective the longer the game goes on, even in this matchup and many other matchups. So you want to try to get your early damage in with your creatures as much as possible with this archetype. Our opponent has obviously they have something here. Okay, it's sale free booter. It's unfortunate. I guess they could potentially have General Kudro, but this is most likely uh, most likely kite sale free booter. Champion, sure. Once again, we might see that thing with. Uh, I'm gonna play a land here, just to attack with everything. All right. So because skull, this says protection from red and from black. But because of this cannot damage cannot be prevented, protection abilities go out the window. 
So once again, these triggers go on the stack, making our creatures bigger. That is able how we are able to kill Oriok Champion. A little bit of an advanced trick, but something, you know, you learn as you play Magic, there are ways to get around certain things. And that was one of them. So our opponent will probably play their Kite Sail Freebooter here. Another Oriok Champion. That'd be unfortunate. Well, it gains life because a creature is the battlefield. And this is what, once again, what they call the stack. These abilities go um, in a, in the air basically, and they resolve opposite of the order that they come into play. Take our spell. Go ahead and play our spell. The spell is a sorcery. So we have to play it during what we call our two main phases here, main phase one or main phase two. Ideally, we want to play it, obviously, before we go to combat. So our opponent's going to get a free block here. Obviously, they, they have full knowledge that this, this can block this turn. So. Okay. Probably a Phantasmal Image. Yep. Nope. This looks like a uh, Meddling Mage. It's a Meddling... Nope. Unsettled Mariner. That's unfortunate. This is a card that has the creature Shapeshifter, but Shapeshifters are changelings. They're humans. So... Makes it so... Basically everything costs one additional mana to target on your opponent's side of the battlefield. Meddling Mage. So we're going to come down and name a card. Um, spells with that name can't be cast. So, say if they name Lightning Bolt here, I'm not going to be able to cast Lightning Bolt. But they'll most likely name Searing Blaze. No, they named Lightning Bolt. Interesting. with their flyer so they really don't want to block and give me the spell back anyway so and then they had get exalted from this noble hierarch All right, and once again you're kind of seeing one of the potential downsides of burn is if burn runs out of gas um, you know a lot of times uh, I gotta play another kite sail or is this the general? Looks like this is the general. Oh, Kemball. <laughs> All right, so the game's basically over. <laughs> so, basically, Kemball says every time an opponent casts a non creature spell, so every time we play one of our burn spells, our opponent gains two life and we lose two life. So. Effectively, this means if I don't draw a kill spell to this creature soon, we're just dead, so. Alright. With that, I'm going to go ahead and scoop it up. Um, theoretically, we could play this game out for another turn or two. But uh, creatures in the face of what our opponent's doing aren't particularly good. And we're, once again, flooding, doing the term called flooding out, which basically means... Aggressive decks only want to draw two, three, or four lands. Uh, there are some ways to get around this. There, are, in, especially in this format, there's things called canopy lands and such, but those kind of go with the more expensive mana bases. So when you're playing with a um, budget version, one of the one of the downsides is, well, you we have a lot of the same power and spells, and a lot of the same creatures as the fully powered burn deck. Uh, we don't have the ability to mitigate what they call flood quite as well 
which means once we hit that point, we're just kind of at the mercy at the top of our deck. So unfortunately, this is going to be a defeat, but got to see both the best and the worst of, of burn in, in certain things. And humans is generally not considered a good matchup for the burn archetype, even the fully powered version of burn um, can sometimes struggle with uh, that particular deck. So back in a bit with match number two. Hey, we're back for our second match with Budget Boros Burn. Once again, we're on the play, which is where you want to be whenever you are playing an aggressive deck, especially. Once again, this hand, we have some one drop creatures. Uh, so you want to lead on these, and then you'll want to lead on your spells following that. So lead on Basic Mountain, as it's the one that doesn't deal you any damage. And then. Opponents taking what they call a mulligan, which means whenever you look at your opening hand, uh, you have a decision to make whether you keep this hand or not. And then each time you put your hand back, you draw seven cards and then put one card back for each time you've mulligan. So if you keep after mulliganing twice, you would put back two cards of your choice on the bottom of your deck. So our opponent is mulliganing aggressively, likely. So that means they put usually puts them on a certain range of decks. So, things like combo decks or uh, those kind of things. Alright, I'm going to play this match out even though I <clears throat> really don't want to. So our opponent is likely on a deck that is referred to as Bogles. Uh, Bogles is a deck that tries to win the game via uh, creatures that are untargetable. So this card is an enchantment, Leyline of Sanctity. Basically says if it's in your opening hand, you can put it into play. And then your opponent can't target you with spells, basically. Okay, sure. We're going to kill this core spirit walker. So here, we're going to kill their creature. <clears throat> I kept a risky hand, it looks like. So this is an O2 creature. Every time you play an ore on it, it gets bigger. So our opponent likely has a second one. Shram. Okay. So they are a slightly different version of Okay. <clears throat> We're going to continue attacking here. Ideally, we would like our opponent to block with Shram. Well, we're going to do this using uh, Soulscar Mage's static ability. Uh, basically, the damage these this is going to deal is going to reduce, give it minus one, minus one counters. And then after combat, we're going to cast the spectacle ability on Skewer the Critics to finish it off. It gets to play what they call Horizon Land, which is named after the Horizon Canopy here. And we actually get to steal a win against uh, Boggles. It's called Boggles because there's a card called Slippery Boggle that is a one drop with a uh, thing called Hexproof. 
Hexproof means we can't target that creature. We happen to get a little bit lucky that the cards that we played there lined up against what they were doing. So in this matchup, you want to bring in Wear Tear. Because the tear part especially is important to remove Leyline of Sanctity. And then the other card we want to bring in is Deflecting Palm. Now this is that kind of conditional card I talked about in the uh, intro here that allows us to potentially tag a creature our opponent has. And then the other cards we want to bring in are Skull Cracks. So our opponent showed us Shram and Core, whatchamacallit, but I couldn't presume they're just Bogles. So I'm bringing in this package. Skullcrack prevents them from linging life, which they have quite a few ways of doing that in their deck. And then we're going to go down the cards that target creatures and players. Because even if we can target their creatures like the, the week we could that game, um, if they have a ley line in play, we cannot target them with Searing Blaze. And then the other card to go down, I guess Rift Bolt. Boros Charm I normally take out in these situations, but there are certain situations where the double strike or indestructibility can come up. So we will go like this. Opponent kept a seven card hand. Um, this hand's decent if they don't have a ley line, but I'm going to presume they do, but even so, I still think it's a keep. Okay, they don't, sure. Must just have a really good Bogle hand. Yep. Glade Cover Scout, effectively the same thing as Slippery Bogle. Beyond Inspiring Vantage, play Swiss Spear. Next turn, we'll probably play another Swift Spear and suspend Rift Bolt. Oh, another Glade Cover Scout, sure. Okay, so I have a 3 1. I guess we're just going to play both creatures here. Just lead on Swift Spear. Opponent does not block. Play another Soul Skirmage. Interesting that they didn't fetch up a second white source. They already had it in hand, that's why. These don't have Daybreak Cornet. Alright. They're putting them on... You did not learn your lesson, did you? Alright, so interesting situation to be in. Don't like casting this main phase against a deck with so much life potential life gain. All of our creatures bigger than all of theirs. Okay. It's 
skin. Kind of hoping to fade the uh, Wow, okay. So we actually got there against one of Burns' rougher matchups. So they were missing their big pay payoffs, it looks like. So nice to pick up a win against one of Burns' matchups. The reason why this is a difficult matchup is we can't always target their creatures. And they have this huge... Uh, Aura that gives their creatures plus three plus three uh, life link, which means it deals dam whenever it deals damage they gain life. Uh, first strike, which means they have the ability to deal damage first, which there are two types of combat. There is regular damage, which most creatures deal, and then this thing called first strike. Basically, first strike damage gets dealt first before normal combat damage. And um, Probably actually be a deck we're visiting later on because I think Vaz has a budget version of Bogles to roll, roll with. But uh, yeah, nice to pick up a win with against one of tr Burns' traditionally more difficult matchups. But you kind of see what we have to do in this matchup. You have to try to be aggressive, get on the battlefield. And uh, while well, Soul Mage isn't a card normally in uh, traditional Burn, um, it served us pretty well in this particular uh, matchup. So, be back for one more match, I think, before doing a short wrap-up. We're back for the third match with Foz's donation playthrough here for a $150 budget deck for a friend of his. So, this hand's a little bit interesting. Um, when you're evaluating aggro hands, uh, you're going to cast, like, you have to evaluate how many of your spells you can cast. So here we can currently cast four of our spells off of our one land, and we are on the draw. So what the draw means is you 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 start with basically one extra card from when you're on the play. When you're on the play, you get the advantage of being the first to act. When you're on the draw, you get an extra card, because you draw a card at the beginning of your turn, whereas on the first play, first turn when you're on the play, you don't get to draw a card. So. I think with that, that in mind, we'll have two draw steps to hit a second land. I'm inclined to keep this hand, as it has a nice aggressive start, and we also have the ability to interact with our opponent. So it looks like we'll be up against some style of control deck, which I think is perfect for evaluating or explaining magic in general with aggressive decks. So, lean you know, on Battlefield Forge. Lost our Swiss Spear. Do a tack step, hit them for one, pass the turn. So our opponent is likely on some type of. Okay, say so a thing in the ice. Never mind. So now we're left with a most interesting situation. Do we try to kill our opponent's creature or do we just go for the throat and deal them as much damage as possible. So, I'm going to go ahead and go to attacks first, since we can... Well, let's play Lava Spike first. Since this is a sorcery, yeah, we have to play this one. We could just hold up Double Lightning Bolt, which are instants. Once again, you can play them at basically any time. Get a Prowess Trigger. See if our opponent is willing to trade an attack plus a bolt for their thing in the ice. They are? Okay, they're not. They are? Sure. Go ahead and bolt this. If they have force of negation, they have force of negation. Doesn't look like they do. So we get to kill their thing in the ice. So the danger with thing in the ice is once it's four counters are removed, it becomes a 7-8 and can close the game very quickly. So the longer these games draw out, well, they do tend to favor a controlling deck, especially since our opponent might be on mono blue, which is curious. Um, go ahead and go to attacks here. When you're placing against a deck that has blue in it, you don't always want to cast your spells during your turn. 
And that's why I'm just attacking here and doing the thing. I'm gonna wait for the opportunity for our opponent to tap low on mana. For instance, they're doing it now. I'm gonna go ahead and resolve Boros Charm. So the reason why I'm prioritizing Boros Charm here is because it's a four damage spell as opposed to one of our three damage spells. So, and with burn, you often deal chunks and damage of th and chunks of three. So while it would be nice to resolve this in conjunction with the Swiss Beer and get an extra point of damage and put them to ten, sometimes you play a little bit of a uh, of a of a game game of chicken with a control deck because they have things known as counter spells, which basically says, um, yeah. Guess what they do here. All right, sure. Hopefully, we'll draw a land. So now I get to go with spear, Boros charm your face. So now I have a choice of do I want to just get my opponent dead or do I want to attack their Jace? All right, since they're expending resources here to key to not take four damage, I think I'm gonna use this opportunity to kill Jace. Now normally I don't, when, I, when I'm playing a burn deck, I don't bother with Planeswalkers unless they're like threatening to my position. But Jace is a card that can accrue them more and more and more spells. And it really does look like they're a mono blue uh, control deck. Which is interesting. It does mean it's more difficult for them to deal with creatures. Five mana. Walking Ballista? No, here we go. Okay. Field of Notice, they have a companion. Companion is a newer mechanic. Uh, outside of the game of outside the normal rules of deck building I'll explain them a little bit more um, whenever I uh, kind of do the deck tech for the more advanced versions of burn of late or the more the complete versions of burn that have been kind of doing the thing so Lava spike you. Boros charm you. Throw up onto three. No reason to attack our swift spear into their four or five here. So. I've kind of given up the focus of their creatures now. Okay, so they do have a red splash. Sure, they have a thing in the ice. With three cards in hand, sure. So I'm going to pass turn because either way, our opponent's going to have access to just about as much mana here. So maybe, actually, maybe I'm supposed to do this main phase. I have to have two counter spells I can cast. Well, I mean, unfortunately. Disappear, they have multiple counter spells. Okay. Can't say I'm terribly surprised here, but it is annoying nonetheless. Opponent might get the win here, unfortunately. Especially if they can cast two spells to flip this thing in the ice. Okay. Let's get our 
kind of finds here. We find a lightning bolt. We just have two bolts. Okay, there's one. Once again, speaking of, these are planeswalkers. They have unique abilities to them. Uh, they're kind of like a little brother or sister on the battlefield. Uh, you can attack them directly. You can interact with them directly. And then, yeah. So they are blue-red control. So against a control deck, we don't really have a ton of interaction for them. Um, Searing Blaze isn't great in this matchup because their only creatures are usually value-oriented creatures. They may not even have a card called Snapcaster Range, which is a 2-1 that allows them to play a spell from their graveyard. Um, they have Thing in the Ice, which generally requires Searing Blaze plus another card to remove, so I think I'm going to cut these. And obviously it doesn't kill Yurion. I'm going to bring in two Path to Exile. Now, generally, you don't want to be bringing in stuff like Path to Exile against a controlling deck. But sometimes you need to get their creatures out of the way. And then, as a final piece of thing, we're going to bring in two copies of Skullcrack. Because while it's not extremely likely that a deck with um, blue and red spells are usually able to gain life, but sometimes there are things like uh, artifacts that allow them to gain life. So we want to be on the play here. Being on the play is better usually. Basically on the play you get to kind of set the, the tone for how the game is going to play out. When you're on the draw, it's a little bit harder to uh, do that. You're more reacting to what your opponent's doing. So this hand is fine. Um, it's not great when you're evaluating an aggressive burn hand. You're, you're looking at both spells and creatures and we have no creatures in this hand. But I do think the spells are fine enough. Uh, Path to Exile, well, not fantastic if they have a turn two thing in the ice. Oftentimes, it's just right to go ahead and get rid of that card. And then once again, they have a companion. So companions are a something in your sideboard, but you can reveal them at the beginning of the, the game if your deck meets certain building requirements. For instance, in this case, companion, your starting deck contains at least 20 cards more than the minimum. So instead of having a 60 card deck, you must have a minimum of an 80 card deck to play Yurion. And then they, they offer certain benefits. So like this one, whenever it comes into play, uh, can exile any number of non-land permanents they control. So like how they were playing that card, um, Omen of the Sea, that came into play, had some abilities. They, they do things like that in order to... Uh, So if Hunt's going to be at least, if nothing else, bluffing that they have the card spell snare that they got us with last time. So we're just going to pass here, see if they use any mana. So we have to be very careful. Yep. Definitely appears like they're trying to hold up... Uh, Hold up Spell Snare, which is a counter spell that counters anything with exactly converted mana cost of two. So we have both Boros Charm and Skullcrack here. I'm going to use Skullcrack to try to draw out the, the uh, Spell Snare if they have it here. Okay, so maybe they don't have it. Um, reason why I was doing that is because Boros Charm once again does more damage. Uh, so Skewer of the Critics is a little bit awkward because um, in these kind of situations because it does cost 3 mana and it is a sorcery. So we've already done our opponent 3 damage this turn so we want to use the Spectacle cost while we can. Pass through the turn. So now we have 7 points of burn in our hand and our opponent is at 8. So we're in a decent position. Pass turn here. 
Soul Scar Mage is a bit awkward at this point. So the problem with Soul Scar Mage or casting Soul Scar Mage at this point would be the fact that um, our opponent could either counter it or deal with it in some other way. And I think we're going to win this game mainly on the back of spells. So I'm actually going to go ahead and pass the turn instead of casting Soul Scar Mage. And when, if we draw another land next turn or something, we might uh, feel free to cast this. But once again, not going to cast anything. Our opponent is not putting us under any pressure. We're not under any obligation. And then we draw the second path. It's probably one of the worst draws in our deck. First one's fine, second one, eh, you know, not really a whole lot going on there. Once again, when you're playing against a counterspell deck and you get to this point, you're just kind of playing a waiting game. Sure, you have to put a knot back on top. Once again, no reason to act. Swiss Spear out. Let's see if I try to use an Archmage's Charm on it. Nope. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and path it here to get some more mana. I'm be very curious if our opponent's actually going to counter this. Interesting. Sure. It's interesting that they would use a remand there. Yep. So remand is a unique counter spell in that it just puts the spell back in our hand as opposed to countering it. It's mainly used as what they call a tempo play. A tempo play is something that you use in order to, um, sure. So, and suspend this. So Rift Bolt, remember, is that unique card that has that suspend situation with it. I'm going to play a Soul Scar Mage. Once again, our objective is to completely overload our opponent's mana. So one thing when you're playing against a deck with counter spells is you want to try to overload their mana as the burn deck. And that's one of the things with having both instants and sorceries is you have the ability to like force your component to kind of play your game a little bit. I have a feeling they're going to get a... Okay, so they just have another uh, Ether Gust. Put that on the bottom. So Ether Gust is a special card that says choose target spell or permanent that's red or green. The owner can choose to put it either on the top of their library or on the bottom of their library. We're obviously not particularly interested in uh, that card going back on top of our deck. So, let's get presenting us a clock now. So this is during our upkeep. So, before the main phase when a sorcery would normally be cast. We go ahead and target our opponent. This with another ether gust or a remand. So we will see if our opponent has a spell snare. They do. Okay. Doesn't completely surprise me. 
go ahead and get this Bone Crusher Giant off the battlefield. Just because it represents such a faster clock than the other stuff our opponent has going on. So remember how I was talking about earlier back with the skull crack that our opponent likely had a spell snare? It seems that they either had one and chose not to use it, or they were saving it for a better spell like Boros Charm. So now we're in an awkward spot since the Boros Charm got countered that we need to resolve three spells as opposed to just two. I'm just going to go ahead and suspend this. I'm going to play the Mountain Out since we don't have Searing Blaze in our hand. We're not worried about playing lands to trigger landfall. So. Okay. Opponent has an opt, which is an instant that allows them to look at the top credit of their library. Can draw it or put it on bottom, just to put it on the bottom. Hmm. The smell is there, sure. <laughs> Curious if our opponent will. Nope, and they're not going to play Urion. Okay. I was trying to get them to shuffle their library with Path to Exile without them uh, getting a Spell Snare. This is a spell with four different modes. They're choosing counter target spell and they get to draw a card. Put them to one. And we cannot pay, so. On the positive side, they don't have any pressure in play. On the negative side, we have no cards left in hand and they're still at four life. So, so again, this is a position that like burn decks don't want to like to get to. Um, why the more expensive decks tend to do the things they do. I was going to cast Yuri on here. Yurion comes into play, gets to blink the Sarkham's Astrolabe, which whenever it enters the battlefield, uh, draws a card. It comes back at the end of turn, they get to draw a card. And they still have three mana up here, so. We draw a land, pass turn. No sense in playing it, revealing to our opponent that we have nothing that matters. Part of, part of magic can be the mind games that you can play with opponents. Yeah, it looks like our opponent's just going to double bowl this out here. Another bolt. And that's the game. So that is that for the third match. I'll be back with a bit of a wrap up uh, in terms of talking about the the deck and the more advanced versions of the or more expensive full versions of the deck. So I'll be back in a second with that. So this is the deck that we've been playing throughout these three uh, matches. You know, it was the budget one hundred fifty dollar or less Boros Burn deck. So. What does this deck not have that some of the fully powered versions of Burn uh, do? So, notably the land base here is a lot weaker, and some of the creature base is not the same. The spells are relatively the same. Um, 
That's kind of customization you get a little bit with Burn, but we'll get into that as we're talking about the next version. So this version is the fully powered version of Boros Burn. This will usually run you about $100 or so, maybe a little bit more, more than the other version. And most of that is right here in the land base. So a couple of things this version runs that the other version doesn't is it runs something called fetch lands. So fetch lands are a land that you play. You tap it, pay it one life, sacrifice it. You can then search your library for a mountain, uh, mountain or a plains or whatever card. You only want to use what they call the red fetch lands. So something that can can search up mountains. So in this deck, you're either searching up Sacred Foundry, which is also an upgrade. It's a land that is both a um, it's both a mountain and a plains. Comes into play. You can play it tapped for not paying any life, but generally in this deck, you're going to be playing things a little bit more aggressively. So you're going to be playing the, playing this into play. So you're doing doing yourself a little bit more damage than even necessarily the other version of the land base we were playing. But it does allow you to have more access to white mana without having to play a bunch of white sources. Um, you also have basic mountains that you can fetch up, which allow you to cast most of your spells once again, except for Boros Charm and Lightning Helix. And then the other innovation to these, in addition to these uh, fetch lands, which there are several different types, there are wooded foothills, bloodstained mires, there's scalding tarns, and the final one is arid mesa. Uh, you can the four are interchangeable in burn it really doesn't matter which one you use generally people opt for the cheaper ones which are usually i think arid mesa and wooded foothills at the moment and then you know if they want to show off sometimes they'll get scalding tarns or and such but functionally they, they're all the same they don't particularly matter and you can only play uh one thing i did forget to mention you can only play four of any particular card across your entire uh deck the other thing that's notable about burn decks is this card called Sunbay Canyon, or as I mentioned in the video, I think it was in the Bogles video, there's this thing called Horizon Lands. And, and they're so called that because of the, the original card that they're templated off is called Horizon Canopy. So this is a, you tap it, pay one life to add red or white, and then if you have too many lands or you're out of gas, you can pay one and then sacrifice this land to draw another card. So what this helps to do is this helps to mitigate those situations where we're drawing a bunch of lands and we're out of action. Uh, this allows you to, you know, have your have your lands kind of function as, as an additional draw spell. Give you a redraw to try to do more things. As far as the sideboard, the only thing of note here is there is an enchantment. Uh, one of those uh, ley lines that we were talking about, which is a card if it's in your opening hand. Um, you can put it directly into play after you've decided whether you're keeping your hand or not. Um, once you keep your hand, you can do this as a pre-game action instead of paying its, its mana cost. And this particular one has the functionality of any time your opponent would target you with a spell or target one of your creatures with a spell, then you they, this deals them two damage, which is nice. Keeping your creatures alive, it's good in, in certain matchups where your opponent's pointing a lot of spells at your face, whether it be another red mirror or people th doing what they call discard spells, which are usually black spells that target look at, target player. They get to look at your hand, take a card. Um, but this is not the only version of burn that exists. But basically, and the only other major thing is, as opposed to Soulscar Mage, which is that one-two with the prowess mechanic. Um, Goblin Guide is a 2-2 creature with haste. So, much like Monastery Swift Spear, you can come in, attack the turn you play it. Uh, Goblin Guide does have the downside of revealing the top card of your opponent's library. If it happens to be a land card, it goes to their hand. If it's a non-land card, it just stays on top. So, while this is definitely a downside to be giving your opponent lands, um, Burn is ideally trying to kill your opponent before they can leverage those extra cards. The other thing is, is it also gives you knowledge of, like, if your opponent's going to draw a particularly devastating spell, it gives you some amount of knowledge of, you know, what they're playing, you know, and what to play around in the future once you, you get more familiar with this archetype. The final thing is there's this new companion or new, new evolution um, called Companions, which 
the one burn usually chooses to play is this card called Luris of the Dream Den. Now this is a card that basically says each permanent card in your starting deck has to be cost two or less. So you can still play spells, for instance, Skewer the Critics here, that cost three. But since it's not a creature, or it's not a permanent, it's a spell. So permanents are lands, creatures, enchantments, planeswalkers, artifacts, etc. So everything in your deck has to cost two or less, other than you know your instants and sorceries. So this version also tries to take advantage of the companion slot, which basically during each of your turns, if Loris is in play, you can cast a permanent spell from your graveyard that costs two minutes or less. So basically, you can cast, you know, a Monastery Swift Spear, a Goblin Guide, an Eidolon of the Great Rebel. Uh, and the notable card that, that fuels this thing is a card called Mishra's Bobble. Now Mishra's Bobble, um, not the greatest card, it's an artifact. So it, it's a card you can only play at sorcery speed, much like creatures. Um, and you put it into play. And then anytime you wish, you know, when the stack's clear or whatever, you can target any player and then look at the top card of that player's library. And then during the next turns, uh, so you have the untap and then the upkeep pays. During the beginning of that upkeep, there's a trigger that goes on the stack. Now trigger is something that just, it's this ability that goes on the stack and then allows you to draw a card. So what Luris does is Luris allows you to rec recur this on turn three, as early as turn three, and start drawing a bunch of extra cards, which that's that's a tremendous advantage. Um, other versions also play more cards to abuse with Luris, but I'm not going to get in too much into those specifics. But this version is a little bit more expensive than the, even the other version I showed you. A lot of people think this card might be some, something they get called banning, that might be removed from the format and you can't play that, or they might remove this Mishra's Bobble. So for now, if you happen to like Burn after playing the budget version, I would suggest you build towards something similar to this, and then decide if you want to make the extra splash into uh, buying Luris and Mishra's Bobbles. So that's pretty much all there is to cover about the budget Burn. A little bit of learning how to play the deck, um, I have a ton of other videos on the channel about the actual uh, learning to play or playing playing gameplay of the more powered up versions of Burn, but Foz wanted me to donate here for you to be able to see the uh, budget version and kind of get a feel of what this deck's strategy is. Once again, this is what they call an aggressive deck. An aggressive deck tries to kill you as quickly as possible. So that's it. I'm going to wrap up the first of... This is at least five, there might be up to seven or eight videos, depending on um, how much Foz wants me to go through things. But as always, this has been John for MTG Nexus. I hope you all have a great day.